We are coming now to section seven of this class on philosophy of economics, and the topic is behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is a new subdiscipline of economics that was firstly rather controversial because it was an explicit attack on neoclassical economics, showing that there were anomalies in uh, neoclassical economics that could only be treated with a new approach to economics. That concerns the descriptive side of economics, not the normative side. Um, now, behavioral economics has become a part of mainstream economics, Nobel Prizes uh, and everything, um, and uh, this is what we're doing now. Now, the literature, I have a central text here to offer, and that's a, a review article, sort of, by Eric Angner and George Lovenstein. Behavioral economics, both authors are really specialists in uh, behavioral economics. Uh, Angner has written a book, um, a course on behavioral economics, and George Lovenstein is one of the pioneers, one of the founding fathers of uh, the whole discipline. Um, that review article is in the anthology Philosophy Economics, edited by Uskali Mackey. So it's a very readable, fat article, and you get all the information that you want to have, and probably even more. Now, supplementary text I'm offering here is Kahneman and Tversky, Prospect Theory and Analysis of Decision and Risk. This is an absolute landmark paper. Um, that is uh, the basis um, of prospect theory, as the title says. One of the most important papers ever written in the history of economics, published in 79. And a very instructive book by Richard Thaler. He also won the Nobel uh, for Economics, Misbehaving the Making of Behavioral Economics. Thaler is, like Kahneman and Tversky, uh, absolute pioneer, founding father of behavioral economics. And in this book, you get something very nice, namely a sort of autobiography of Thales with respect to behavioral economics, of course, and also a history of behavioral economics, all these ideas and interactions. And of course, Kahneman and Tversky and others um, feature in this story. It's, very, it's a very good read. It's nice to read, very informative. Uh, he's got a very good writing style, so I can recommend this book strongly. Okay. Now, the aim of this session is not to give you a complete overview over the different topics that are treated in behavioral economics. Um, it's rather an understanding of the emergence of behavioral economics against the background of neoclassical economics. We will see that there is quite some tension between neoclassical economics and behavioral economics. So it is interesting to see what the background of this tension is and how this tension eased somehow in the time when behavioral economics began to emerge. If you want to have an overview of the most important research area of behavioral economics, then I recommend to you the article by Enger and Lovenstein that I mentioned sections four to six. There you get the empirical material, but that's really not, in a sense, philosophy of behavioral economics, but it's rather, so to speak, a general introduction into behavioral economics. Now, the most important methodological device that is used in behavioral economics is the experiment. It's not the only one, but it's the most important one. And that I dissolved from this um, um, section here and created a section by itself, namely section eight of this class. And next week uh, you will be confronted with that. And there I will discuss um, in a broader context what are experiments and how are they used uh, in economics. So the content uh, of this section is then I will tell you something about the background of post-war neoclassical economics in the 1940s and 1950s. You may remember that neoclassical economics, according to a very plausible periodization, has a pre-Second World War uh, phase and a post-Second World War phase. 
and the post-war Second World War phase is the sort of neoclassical economics you were trained in your studies and that developed in the 1940s and 1950s against a certain background and if you understand that background then you understand why neoclassical economics is as it is and why this sort of background then weakened and gave room for um, economic for need for behavioral economics later on i first give you this background in section one and then in uh, chapter one and in, in chapter two i give you i tell uh, 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 present you some effects on economics from the 1940s on and then the interesting uh, uh, development leading them or preparing the ground for behavioral economics are the factors that led to a decline of these background positions that were stabilizing um, uh, neoclassical economics and you have to understand how that decline worked in order to understand how behavioral economics had a chance to get some ground within the large discipline of economics. Now we start with this background of post-war neoclassical economics in the 1940s and 1950s and there are some positions that were both um, common in the social sciences, especially in the Anglo-Saxon countries and in philosophy. And these positions uh, were behaviorism, positivism, verificationism, and operationalism. You may have heard these terms or you may have not have heard them. I'm going to explain them to you <clears throat> and to understand why these positions could become so important and really dominating for the development of economics in the 1940s and the 1950s. Now, something is common to them, and one should understand the basis uh, of them, namely, they, there is a fear of error in science due to speculation and missing empirical control. It's an attempt to develop a truly scientific spirit. So whatever your relationship is to these different positions, whether you like them or not, what you have to appreciate is what's the main motivation behind them. And the main motivation is, of course, a really scientific one. Try to avoid error. Try to avoid speculation. Try to be as truthful to the facts, to the facts as possible. This is the idea behind these positions and you miss an important aspect of them if you do not know the idea behind them. And therefore I'm developing uh, these uh, four positions um, in this uh, way. Let's start with behaviorism. It was, behaviorism was something that was developed in psychology at the end of the 19th century, mainly in the uh, United States, but it also had influence worldwide on psychology um, it was dominant during the first half of the 20th century in the United States. And it had a clear enemy. And the enemy was depth psychology and introspective methods. Depth psychology, this is mainly Freud uh, and, uh, and Adler and Jung. They had some idea about something about the unconscious or subconscious. Um, and uh, they, they were basing their theories about uh, concepts coming from there. And then also introspective methods, introspective methods where you try to understand uh, psychological phenomena by introspection. You just look in a way into yourself and then you discover certain psychological processes and um, they are then the basis for introspective psychology. Now, the objections against this sort of methodology or this way of approaching uh, psychological phenomena that came into disrepute because they were seen as not empirically controlled and not making experimentally testable predictions so the point was simply that people said well, if you use these hypotheses about depth psychology or if you use introspective methods you may claim anything and I cannot control that, what you are claiming. And um, if you have the spirit of the experimental sciences, then of course you want to run experiments in order to test the assertions or claims of a science. And uh, evidently 
uh, there are few or if any um, experimental tests of the claims of depth psychology or of course by the very nature of the thing of introspective methods so this was the main thing we do not like that we behaviorists we do not like these um, uh, directions in psychology because empirical control is just missing experimental tests are impossible and therefore this is not real science um, the general idea was then that contrary to these uh, uh, two directions that i mentioned only observable behavior is legitimate for psychology and that is if that burns down to stimuli and responses so what you can do in psychology in research you can give some subject some stimuli and you control them so uh, some perception for instance and then what you can also see is responses uh, overt behavior um, and a real scientific psychology is then a psychology that is basically um, um, a psychology of stimuli and responses so that's behaviorism that sounds pretty restricted but the point again is that the idea was if you want to scientifically scientifically control what you are claiming in a science then you must have observational control and observational control in psychology then is you know stimuli and responses that's the basic idea and that was for certain, some uh, decades the dominant position in, uh, in uh, psychology, especially in the United States, first half of the 20th century was dominated by behaviorism. So that's the first thing, and that's very important to understand if you want to understand the social sciences in the Anglo Saxon countries in the first half of the 20th century, then behaviorism is a very important source in the background. The next thing is positivism. Positivism has a long history in philosophy, but also in the 19th century in some of the sciences, in sociology, for instance. It was in the 19th century created and named by Auguste Comte, a French sociologist and philosopher. Um, and um, in the 20th century, positivism became uh, very famous again by the marriage with the new form logic yielding a philosophical position that was called logical positivism. Logical positivism was created mainly in Vienna in uh, the um, uh, 1910s and 1920s, 1930s um, of the last century. That was the idea that a truly scientific philosophy is a philosophy that uses logics as its formal instrument and positivism as its starting point, meaning that we have to start from the positively given. Um, the positively given is sense data, about which error is supposed not to be possible. So a sense datum is, for instance, you're sitting in the front of your screen and the screen is just blue, then a sense datum was seen as as what you get with your senses, namely, there is blue here now. And the idea was that error about sense data is not really possible. There was some discussion about that, but basically this is the most secure foundation we can provide for science. So the basic idea of positivism is if we want to build up a serious science that we can really control, where we can avoid error, we got to start with sense data and build up from there. So we must be clear about our basis of our observations by sense data and build up the claims that we make about the world, hypotheses, um, explanations and whatnot. We got to start with sense data and build up from there. And the main instrument for building up is then formal logic. So again, what you see here is a spirit of being scientific, of being in control, in avoiding error. That's the main idea again also of positivism. And therefore, even if you don't like positivism for whatever reason, you have to see the background is a very good one in the sense that a science is something where you should try 
to avoid error and where you can justify the claims that you are making as good as possible. All right. Now, the next thing is verificationism. This is something you've probably not uh, have encountered yet because this is a rather philosophical uh, thing that was also developed in the Vienna Circle in logical positivism in the 1920s. And that is a um, story about uh, meaning of sentences. So the question that was uh, virulent uh, in the Vienna Circle um, at that time was what is philosophy? And if philosophy is anything, well, it formulates certain sentences. And the question is, how, what is the meaning of philosophical sentences? And especially if there are these sentences, how can they be justified, verified, tested, and so on? That depends, of course, on what the meaning of a sentence is. And the idea of some of these people in logical positivism was that much of traditional philosophy is just meaningless. That was an idea already developed uh, by David Hume uh, a couple of centuries earlier, where Hume said sentences either belong to mathematics, well, that's fine, and you try to give proof, or they belong to empirical science, okay, then you have to empirically test them, or they don't have sense, and you should forget about that. Um, and this was the, the same radical position in logical positivism, and they claimed that much of philosophy, especially before, of course, uh, the Vienna philosophy, consisted of meaningless sentences. So they had to, to have some sort of criterion to determine whether a sentence has meaning or doesn't have meaning. And verificationism is a very specific position in that respect. The meaning of a sentence is its method of verification. Now, that sounds possibly very strange, but you may immediately take examples of empirical sentences in which you see there is something to that uh, statement here. So imagine that someone claims that the moon consists of blue cheese. If you say, what does that mean? Then, of course, you are pretty close, at least in the vicinity of that meaning. If you say, well, how can I find out whether the moon really consists of blue cheese? And then, of course, you have to verify that somehow, and which means you have to travel to the moon, get some of the matter there, and look whether it's blue cheese or not. So you see that there is indeed some sort of connection between finding out whether a certain sentence is true, that this is deeply connected with what the sentence means. Because a sentence claims something, um, it claims something to be such and such. And if you understand how that claim is investigated, then that method of verification you're very close to, to what the meaning is. Whether that can be identified or not is a different story, but this was the radical position of verificationism. And what I want you to see is that there is some plausibility in that statement. However, that statement has a problem. But first, uh, let's continue here. Uh, then if for a given sentence, no method to verify it is known, the sentence is meaningless. So, and this was the weapon then against um, much of metaphysics of the uh, traditional philosophy, that if you take out some deeper sentence uh, or so-called deeper sentence of philosophy, and then you ask yourself, how can you verify this sentence? So something about the universe, about substance or whatever it is, uh, or about say God, or about uh, the um, eternity of the soul or whatever, then you ask, how can I verify this sentence? And then if nothing comes to mind, then the conclusion is according to this criterion of verification is the sentence is meaningless. So you may see that if you have some vague sentences, which you also find in traditional philosophy, but also in everyday life, and you don't really know what you are talking about, then this criterion tells you very clearly that if you do not know 
how to verify the sentence in principle, then you don't know what you are talking about. This is very radical. Whether that's in this radicality, radicality tenable is a different story, but that's the idea behind um, verificationism. Again, whether one likes that or not, the point is, again, a very scientific spirit behind that, namely to try to weed out vague and untenable and almost empty talk from the realm of a scientific and philosophical discourse. And finally, there's a position operationalism that has also become very prominent in the 1920s, developed in the 1920s by a physicist, Percy Bridgman, an important physicist, um, and uh, Bridgman developed what he learned especially uh, from special relativity theory uh, by Albert Einstein when uh, special relativity uh, criticized the classical concept of simultaneity. So I got to, got to give you a little background here of the physics. So in classical physics, as in everyday life, we believe that two events are either simultaneous or they are not simultaneous. So it's a, an absolute property, a relational property of two events to be either simultaneous or not simultaneous. So that seems to be quite plausible and, and um, unavoidable. Now the point is Einstein asked the question, how do you in fact uh, measure simultaneity? And whatever the details are, uh, the point was done that you have to use light, you know, where you get a signal from one from the two events, and then uh, the uh, signals uh, arrive at you, and from the signals you get from the two events, you must be able to conclude whether they are simultaneous or not. Now, the problem is uh, the uh, signals arrive you at the same time reach you at the same time or at different times depending what your state of motion is relative to these events. So you may sit on a uh, inertial frame as it's called, you, you sit in a coordinate system, you observe these events and now the point is it depends on your movement, on your motion relative to these events whether you get this, the signals of these events at the same time or at different times. The point is now that none of these different coordinate systems in motion relative to these events or in rest relative to these events, none of these um, um, coordinate system uh, has um, a, a special nature. They are all the same from physics, uh, from the point of view of physics, which means that there is no way of determining something like an absolute simultaneity of events because it depends on your state of motion in your coordinate system. Now, the lesson is this. You don't have to understand the details, really. The lesson is this, that a notion like simultaneity, which seems to be absolute, becomes lose or loses its absoluteness when you ask the question how do i really measure this how can i measure simultaneity and then you discover that the idea of absoluteness dissolves once you realize it depends on the measuring process when you determine simultaneity and then you discover oh that object absolute simultaneity does not exist. And from that um, insight, very fundamental insight in physics, in already in special relativity, similar stuff that happened later in quantum mechanics as well, um, the, uh, Bridgman uh, derived the fundamental thesis that the meaning of a concept is the set of operations by which it is measured. So you may see that this is not very far from verificationism, it's somewhat different. But the basic idea is this. If you have a concept like simultaneity and you think you know what it means, then this may be untrue and you can discover the untruth of your preconception if you analyze the set of operations 
by which you measure the concept. And then it's only a small step to make this a little more radical and saying, well, the meaning of a concept is the set of operations by which it is measured. So um, this was um, very influential then in philosophy of science. It also went into the ideas of logical positivism, but um, I don't want to follow it up. Uh, the point again is it's a very critical spirit behind that, trying to learn from special relativity how careful we must be when we speak about the meaning of concepts. Okay, now what do have these positions in common? I gave you a few hints already. Um, the point is that obviously all these positions try to stay as closely as possible to direct observation because there one is on firm ground. Well, perhaps not completely firm, but this is what we humans can do. Uh, we, cannot do, do, do we cannot do more, but I mean observations of macroscopic objects and um, measuring apparatus and so on. This is rather firm ground. <clears throat> and everything that's not directly observable, therefore should be in science strictly reducible to observables. So if you claim anything about something that's not directly observable, you must be able to translate that into statements about observables. And these statements about observables, you are then able uh, to verify or falsify. <coughs> Sorry. Now, these positions and these uh, streams um, of thought had effects on economics from the 1940s on. And um, this is important now if you want to understand the emergence of neoclassical economics, about which I spoke already in one of the earlier sections, uh, but which I want to take up now. Now, if you apply that, these ideas that things must be observable, then you come very quickly to the fundamental element of economic behavior, that is choices. So, uh, of course, in consumer markets is that consumers choose certain objects, certain goods. And also, if you look uh, from the supply side, there are always choices being made on the basis of some uh, considerations. So, the point is, the interesting point here is that actual choices are observable. And therefore, against the background of these philosophical positions that I mentioned, choice data are legitimate. You can observe what someone chooses, at least in principle. And then if you now go uh, to the concept of preferences, which we are interested in uh, in economics, then, and this was the, the dominant tradition in the 40s, if preferences, are, if preferences are revealed preferences, which means that they are revealed through choices, then they are also scientifically legitimate. So if you know the choices, then you can conclude what the preferences are, and then you can got, uh, go even one step further. If preferences fulfill some axioms, so-called rationality, then they can be represented by a non-unique utility function. This is all not, the, the technical details are not important in this context. The most important thing is this, choices are observable, therefore uh, they are scientifically legitimate, and choices can be represented under certain uh, uh, conditions by utility function, therefore the use of an utility function and preferences are legitimate in economics and probably not much more. Now, this is scientifically legitimate, but in fact, nothing beyond that, which means nothing that does not logically follow from them. Aggregation is of course legitimate. So because then you aggregate uh, in some sense, um, you aggregate uh, choice data and as choice data are observable, also you have empirical control over aggregated, um, um, aggregated choice data. And the uh, uh, consequence of that um, uh, uh, stance is that all ties to traditional psychology were cut. So everything that happened in classical uh, economics 
and also partly in, in the first phase of neoclassical economics, where you try to understand preferences in terms of some psychological concepts, all that was cut because you decided in economics, in neoclassical economics, it's only choice data that are relevant. It's only the factual choices. And you do not have to ask what is the cause of the choices. What you do is you translate choices into preferences and utility functions, but then questions of psychology don't even come up. It's the ties to traditional psychology is cut. And the function then of preferences for economics is they are the building blocks to predict future choices. So as far as economics is a science, uh, who, one of whose aims is to predict future choices, you can do that on the basis of choice, choice data that you have. And this is the direction of economics that it took in the 1940s and 1950s. And you will probably recognize that from the uh, lectures you've learned uh, during your undergraduate and also graduate uh, courses. Now, it's interesting now, what are the factors that were leading to the decline of these background positions? They are interesting in so far as only a decline of these factors that makes it understandable why an alternative to neoclassical uh, economics could emerge at all. And um, against all of these positions that I mentioned, some criticism was already voiced in the 1930s. So it is not so that it's absolutely clear that these four positions are just right. But already in the 30s, these things were criticized and the criticism became, became dominant roughly in the 1970s. And not only in economics, but it concerned psychology as well as philosophy and economics. And it's good to see uh, first how this worked um, in uh, psychology and philosophy, because then you can understand better what the effects on economics were. And what happened then from the 70s on is that uh, at least partly that alternative positions became then the mainstream and the older positions were seen as obsolete. So if you look at uh, philosophy, I'm going to say a few words about that. Uh, then uh, these positions are now out, uh, probably uh, mostly uh, in philosophy. So there are very, very few people who would still defend these positions that I mentioned, positivism, verificationism, operationalism, uh, because uh, behaviorism, because they seem to be untenable for various reasons. Uh, now let us look first at psychology, what happened there. Now, um, the, the problem with, in psychology with behaviorism is that a psychology that um, uh, is based on behaviorism is not allowed to speak at all about mental states. Mental states that are thoughts, beliefs, heuristics, wishes, emotions, passions, acts of will, etc. And that sort of psychology becomes very poor because you can only speak about stimuli and responses. And it seems to be that in psychology, we want more. And if we have a methodology that constrains our legitimate talk in science, in psychology, such that we cannot talk about any mental states, then we become more or less quickly frustrated and say there must be a way that we have a scientific uh, approach to mental states that we want to talk about. And there is a, a counter program then developing in the beginning to develop uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and then becoming much stronger in the 1970s. And that was called cognitive science. And cognitive science was addressing unobservable mental, especially cognitive states. And one of them, uh, is of course internal representations. So if you see a car and somehow you and then you think of that car, you some have something like an internal representation of that car. And uh, I can only sketch that here. Cognitive science was then created in a multidisciplinary fashion, and many separate uh, scientific disciplines contributed to it, are still contributing to it. Linguistics, 
cybernetics, neuroscience, computer science, philosophy, psychology, and it became a really multidisciplinary or even interdisciplinary um, enterprise, uh, which is now flourishing, and people speak about the unobservable, which was forbidden in behaviorism. And one of the examples which made a, a breakthrough in this area was linguistics, um, namely language learning. And if you try to understand language learning by a strictly behaviorist program, namely by saying, what are the kids getting as stimuli? And the response is then that when they're one year old or two year old, they speak a language. Then the question is, is that possible? On the basis of the stimuli that you get, that a child learns a language. And then there came the idea in the, um, um, well started in the 50s that people thought no the information you get from the stimulus as a baby by listening to your parents and other people speaking the stimuli that you get are just too poor it's not enough information that whatever your mind is then to get out of that the ability without anything else uh, to learn the language so there must be some sort of inner structure so if you want to speak about language learning, you must speak about an inner unobservable structure in psychology. It's absolutely necessary. And that started to become popular in the 1970s. And that was, of course, an inroad for um, a non-behaviorist uh, psychology by saying our soul or our mental states do have some sort of inner structure. And you, we must find ways to talk about them in a scientific way. So this is just the example of psychology. Here is uh, uh, philosophy. Um, and in philosophy, there came insights that, that showed that these radical programs that I mentioned are just not feasible. And uh, one of the most important insights was that important scientific concepts cannot be defined in terms of uh, observables, namely many theoretical terms that refer to postulated unobservable entities and dispositions. I mentioned already in one of the earlier sections that dispositions are very important in philosophy and they are also, as I think, important in economics because I really think that uh, preferences are nothing but dispositions. But what people found out in the 1930s, much uh, um, uh, frustrating for them, that dispositions cannot be defined in terms of observable um, uh, predicates. So solubility in water, which is a fundamental concept, solubility of chemistry, you cannot define by purely observational terms. So that meant that you should give up lots of chemistry and of physics if you followed the prescriptions of the philosophers who told you that you must only use observable terms. And then, of course, everyone realizes that can't be right. So we've got to make sense of how physicists and chemists, and these are really solid sciences, how they use these concepts and how that works. So a loser connection of observables was necessary in order to stay in contact with physics and the other natural sciences. Um, and also there was an, an, another insight as attractive as this operationalism was. The insight was that there is no way to understand the unity of different measuring operations of, this operations of the same concept. For example, of length on the basis of operationalism. So if you follow up operationalism and you have two different ways of measuring length, then according to operationalism, because the meaning of length is the way you measure that, uh, that entity, then you get two different measures of length, or different ideas or different concepts of length. And our idea is, no, we have one concept of length that is measured by different operations. And what one can, can uh, find out is that under the uh, patronage of operationalism, you never get this sort of unity. That unity it is not constructible in terms of operationalism. And that, of course, shows that something is wrong with operationalism. Of course, it, it's got something right that uh, operations are important, but it can't be that radical that the meaning 
of a concept is really defined by its operations only. So this can't be really true. <clears throat> then there's another thing about verificationism. Again, this sounded very wonderful that you say the meaning of a sentence is the method of its verification. But the insight was then that scientific important sentences cannot be verified. So, so they are meaningless according to this theory. So for instance, scientific laws. If you have any scientific law, the law of free fall, for instance, then they have unlimited generality meaning and an unlimited number of possible applications. And verification would mean that you run through all these applications, but you cannot do that. In principle, you cannot do that because we have only limited time. So you can, in principle, not run through unlimited uh, number of applications, which means that according to verificationism, strictly speaking, scientific laws are meaningless and they cannot be verified. And that, of course, doesn't make sense because, I mean, scientific laws are really the backbone of modern science. And uh, it's uh, just impossible uh, that uh, these sentences have no sense. Make doesn't uh, make sense. And then an additional thing is, uh, but which is rather a, a, a philosophical insight, that the principle of verification is namely meaning of a concept is the method of its verification is according to its own standard meaningless because it cannot be verified. So if you self apply the idea that meaning of a concept is the method of its verification, if you apply that to verificationism, then you see it's got to be meaningless. It cannot be verified. There's no way of verifying this principle. It's just a sort of postulate. So you have the problem, and this is something which happens in philosophy again and again, that self-application shows that something is wrong with the concept. Whether that can be healed or not is a different story. It depends on the context. But in this particular case, it looks rather bad if the principle that you, um, um, that you are declaring is upon self-application meaningless. Now, these problems started to surface in the 1930s. They were partly taken seriously, but not in the mainstream taken seriously. But then they were generally acknowledged in the 1960s. And then led, uh, this led then to major uh, upheavals uh, in philosophy leading to a post-1960 philosophy of science that's um, um, especially Kuhn um, and Feyerabend and Lakatos and that um, uh, distanced itself from these very radical uh, positions from the 1930s and 1940s. Now, what's the relevance for economics? Now, what you see is from the context that both in philosophy and psychology, the result was that the constraint that only the observable is scientifically legitimate, that this constraint loosened. So people realized that this is too radical. And of course, people also realized this in economics. So the spirit affected economics, that the doctrine that only choice data are the only data that are legitimate in economics because they are the only data that are observable and everything else is speculation that this is too radical, it doesn't work in other disciplines, it's not really tenable. Um, and that led in economics also to the idea that it became scientifically legitimate to analyze preferences and related concepts, not only in terms of rational choices. And this was, of course, uh, the, the mainstream in the early uh, neoclassical, uh, post-war neoclassical economics, only choices are relevant and only then you can analyze them in terms of preferences and utilities. Um, and this is all there is to economics and nothing else um, is legitimate. So if you are then somehow justified in analyzing preferences, then this, of course, opened the door to psychology again. Because if you want to know how preferences are formed, then preferences, of course, are somehow the result of psychological processes. And if you want to analyze the genesis of preferences, you've got to look into the mental states and mental processes of subjects. And therefore, the processes of decision making, namely this is uh, what leads to choice, the processes of decision making became a central subject of behavioral economics um, and many of the cases in which actual decisions 
deviate substantially from expected utility theory taken as a descriptive theory were then analyzed. And this is uh, the most important process here. This is the most important single factor leading to behavioral economics. It was the, the insight that many choices actually done by subjects, by human sub subjects, say they deviate substantially what expected utility theory predicts. So for instance, um, in the dictator game, uh, expected utility theory tells you, they, I, I'm sorry, the ultimatum game, expected utility theory tells you that whenever you get something instead of nothing, you will choose something. But the point is in, the, um, uh, in that ultimatum game, the empirical data really differs substantially from that. And that means that somehow expected utility theory taken as a descriptive theory of human behavior is in many situations not correct. Particularly influential in that, in these insights and then the dissemination of that insights were Kahneman and Tversky and also Thaler, among many other people, of course. Kahneman and Tversky proposed prospect theory in 1979. And the very important point is here that although Kahneman and Tversky were both psychologists, they were not economists, they wrote in a way that was accessible to and partially persuasive for economists. Uh, in that sense, prospect theory is a masterpiece in science rhetoric. Uh, I explained to you earlier what science rhetoric is. It's the discipline where you in investigate under which circumstances arguments are successful, are persuasive. And this is what, where Kahneman and Tversky broke an inability of sociologists and psychologists before, namely when they, when psychologists and sociologists criticized, say, the homo economicus idea of e econ economics, then economists usually didn't react. They found it in some sense irrelevant, inappropriate for various reasons, which can be analyzed, but the point is, this was the really first time on a larger scale that now psychologists articulated a criticism of, in this case, expected utility theory that was persuasive for economists. It's a masterpiece of um, science rhetoric. In fact, one of the best articles in that respect I've ever read in my life in any of disciplines into which I look. So this is really a fantastic uh, piece of science and of course, extremely successful, uh, although of course criticized, no doubt, uh, but it's a very important um, piece uh, of economics, of course. And then there was Richard Thaler, and he was trained as an economist in uh, contrast to Kahneman and Tversky, trained as an economist, and he started his program of identifying anomalies of neoclassical economics. So he started as a graduate student. Um, you can read that then in, in Thaler's book, especially chapter 18, how he started this. He, he said, I want to identify anomalies of neoclassical economics, namely where the factual developments, what people do is not in accordance with what uh, neoclassical uh, e economics says as a descriptive discipline. And he was influenced in that, by the way, I think I mentioned it earlier by Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science, because Thomas Kuhn has a very special role for anomalies in science. Namely, they are the things that trigger then revolutionary developments. And Thaler saw that early in his career, realized it, um, and then thought this might be the right um, uh, strategy in order to influence economics. And he was right in that. And the, one of the important things here methodologically that happened at the same time, or not at the same time, this was an integrated uh, part of it, was that the investigation of the adequacy or missing adequacy of expected utility as a descriptive theory, it was mostly carried out by means of experiments of various kinds. And that introduced experiments uh, into economics, which were in the 1950s, thought to be impossible in economics or almost impossible of economics. And it started in the 1950s to, uh, to get some hold in economics. It led to the emergence of a new subspecialty of economics, uh, experimental economics, 
which is an integral part of behavioral economics, but it's not identical with it, and experimental economics will be treated in section eight of this class. Thank you very much.